Hey, 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 welcome back to the Pure Victory Podcast. Matt here, Braden here, uh, big armed half, right? Good. Tarps, tarps. <laughs> People are calling me tarps. It's, yeah, it's, it's started. A yeah, we it's were calling started. you that today, my wife and I. Just We don't call you Matt anymore, or Kleiner, it's just tarps. <laughs> it started. Brad, Mike Braden's got this. God, God, he's got this uh, story he loves telling where uh-huh. I, I took my shirt off right before introducing myself to a new guy for the first time. And it wasn't intentional, but like mid taking my shirt off, I'm like, this is going to be kind of funny. He reached my hand out and the guy just howled. He thought yeah. it was so funny. So Braden's always like, yeah, tarps off, shirts off. Yeah. So he's calling so that's me. his nickname, tarps. So Mike, feel free. <laughs> Call him Carps. <laughs> I'll respond. <laughs> he's, he's trying to get this thing going. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, it's, it's Wait, just so just so we're clear, this is the restored sexuality podcast, and the exactly. hosts are right. taking their shirts right. off while they meet people. That's exactly. right. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Embracing who we are. We embrace it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going all the way back to Genesis two, naked and unashamed. That's Here, right. right. Restored that's sexuality. Right. That's right. I love that. You're unashamed. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's it's uh, uh, it's too much. I'm like, ah, it's working. It's working. People mm-hmm. are reaching out. So, um, anyways, our second repeat guest. We're pumped. We had such a good time with Mike. We it was probably two years ago. I don't know that Something we had like that had yeah. you on. I've been quoting him ever since and following uh, your ministry, Mike. So we're pumped about just having you back and talking about your new book, Taboo. Um, topics Christians should be talking about, but don't. And it's such a good, good uh, uh, book and resource. I've been following just what's in there and following your release of it. And so excited to have you on. Why don't you share a little bit about who you are and what you do besides just uh, authoring life changing books? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me back, guys. Uh, yeah. So I live here in the States in Wisconsin. I'm about three hours north of Chicago, a little bit south of Green Bay. Uh, married my first girlfriend. We just celebrated 20 years together. I had, I had this, uh, grand plan that I was going to romance her and take her to Italy for our 20th anniversary. And it turns out we were in a tent with our two teenage daughters in South Dakota. Way better. Way better. Oh. <laughs> so do, you any, <laughs> do you have any resources to help, uh, husbands who fall short of their promises? I could use yeah. that. <laughs> Stay on after Mike. We'll have a chat. <laughs> I don't know. Like just South Dakota, Rome. It it sounded equally romantic. So (laughs) five star was five star hotel tent. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. We got uh, two daughters. Brooklyn is uh, high school sophomore, fifteen. So I'm in the stage of like smartphone, uh, first boyfriend, learning to drive a car, and then our Maya is an eighth grader. She's fourteen. A soccer player, distance runner who just tore his ACL. So I'm, I'm trying to put my faith in Jesus through all that. Um, I was actually watching a reality soccer show yesterday and I started tearing up like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't play this for a year. So oh, no. <laughs> I'm in the midst of that. Uh, but yeah, life's good. We just launched Taboo a couple weeks ago and I'm super excited to talk with you guys about it today. Oh, that's great. And this is so timely, so needed. Uh, and uh, like your book addresses a lot of different things here. Um, a lot of uh, taboo topics, right? That mm-hmm. we don't tend to talk about it especially specifically sometimes in the church world and and i think that's so great that you're doing that um and there's a lot of specific topics here that i think probably are a little awkward a little hard to touch upon and i think some mm-hmm. people uh, maybe feel that when these co- topics are broached so um w- why did you feel the need to write a book like this uh especially specifically when a lot of this delves into some really awkward areas yeah 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 so the book is about anxiety depression suicide sexual orientation sexual intimacy marriage divorce living together before marriage race politics abuse abortion pornography alcohol and just a couple of other things to make you sweat <laughs> so, I'm, I'm joke we should have like duct taped a stick of deodorant to the back of the book just so you'd be prepared to read it <laughs> yeah yeah but Braden, um you might answer that question, why tackle all that stuff? It, two real quick answers. Number one, because when I was growing up, I was addicted to pornography and nothing really changed for me until I started talking about it. Um, I prayed about it. I repented. I went to church. I read my Bible. I tried to like, you know, me and Jesus are going to change this. And in my experience, like I really didn't see any behavioral change until I stepped out of the dark and started talking taboo. And it was awkward and it was uncomfortable, but on the other side of the awkwardness was a really amazing change and blessing for me. 
And kind of what I've seen pastorally is that the exact same thing happens in church, that if I don't have the courage to get up and talk about this really awkward issue, no one talks back to me. Like, even though I'm their pastor, even though God called me, even though the reason I'm here is to help you with your faith, like, if you're struggling with drinking too much after work, or your marriage is just about, you know, separation, divorce stage, it's it's really rare that people will step into the light unless I start the conversation. And so that's what I've just seen, whether it's families, whether it's a small group Bible study, whether it's a bunch of guys who are friends or a pastor in a congregation, like if, if we don't have the courage to start the conversation, most people won't continue it and they'll stay trapped in the dark with their shame, their secrets and all the things they wish they could change, but they don't. Yeah, it's so true. Eh? It's so many people say about, about talking about sex and porn because that's what we do. They're like, man, that's so good. That's so taboo. I'm just thinking like, and I say it's it's not taboo in scripture. <laughs> it's all throughout <laughs> sexuality is all throughout the Bible. It shouldn't be taboo. It's only taboo if we don't talk about it. And yeah. uh, and so I love what you're saying. How did your story like the first two words in your book are my addiction? And so you're talking about your own story, right? Like, how does your story uh, influence the way that you share when you're sharing publicly? Because a lot of people are scared about sharing their own story or being vulnerable. Right. So the, what yeah. you went through, how does how does your personal story influence the way that you go about it. Yeah. I sometimes think the devil must be so ticked <laughs> that, yeah. that like he, he led me into shameful sin, how, you know, countless times. And now God has taken that and used it to give Jesus glory and save people from addiction. So what, you know, the devil's the father of lies. And I think one of his biggest lies is be quiet. You know, be, be quiet. They're going to judge you. They're going to gossip about you. They're going to be so disgusted with you. They're, you're not going to belong here if you say that. And what I've experienced is that almost every time I say something kind of transparent, the exact opposite of that happens. Right. Is that someone in the room says, oh, man, me too. Or put me on that prayer because I'm in the same boat. Or, wow, this is the kind of church where we can talk about that stuff. It, it makes me feel welcome here, like I belong. So I've just seen, and, and not that, People can't gossip or everyone reacts perfectly. But on the majority of times, I think God's people actually act like God's people. And they're grateful and they draw closer and relationships get stronger and we can forgive each other in Jesus' name. So yeah, I've, I've just seen people assume the worst because the devil's good at his job and God constantly surprises me with how people react. That's cool. Mm. Yeah. Well, I love what you just said. It's it's like you've an area that was once you, you feel that shame. There's some hiddenness there. You want to hide it. You've turned around and now you're sharing. And mm -hmm. and there, there's such power in that to be able to show people that authenticity, but also to understand, hey, there's hope. God mm -hmm. working in my life, you know, I, I the, the, what he has done in my life is possible for you too. And I think so many times that people that are struggling with addiction, I mean, Matt and I can put our hands up to this too. You think that you're the only one or that, you know, no one would understand or that God's angry with you and, and go down the list, right? And, and it's just so difficult to understand how we can turn around as God has worked in our life and help others that are struggling with something yeah. similar. Um, so that's so powerful. Yeah. I'm so appreciative, uh, Mike, that you've been on this journey and now you're doing this. Um, yeah. Now, kind of moving from what you just said there, um, when it comes to a lot of these difficult kind of topics, these difficult areas, and there's a lot of controversy around a lot of these. Um, where maybe are we going kind of wrong here when it comes to church, when our, when our families, um, just even Christ followers in general, hmm. where are we kind of maybe not hitting the mark when it comes to um, having these discussions or dealing with some hmm. of these things? And, and how can we do better? Yeah, great question. Um, I think at least in kind of the conservative Christian circles that I've been a part of, there's two mistakes we make. One is to just say nothing about huge cultural issues and just hope it turns out good. <laughs> you know, we're worried about sex or gender or people being way too political and not enough biblical. But, you know, maybe if I just don't say anything, it'll work out. Which is such a, <laughs> you know, you just say it out loud. Like, what, what, wait, what? How can I expect my kid and my daughters to like get this stuff right if I don't yeah. talk to them about it as their father. Yeah. Um, I sometimes say the world is gonna preach a thousand sermons about these things. Maybe the people who love Jesus and love them should preach one or two of them too. 
So I think silence is the first mistake because we we don't have the perfect answers. We don't say anything. I think the second mistake that I see is that you know if you're passionate about the Bible and you know God's word is the truth, that you speak the truth, but as the Bible says, you you fail to speak it in love. So you know you go on blast about transgenderism. Can you believe the your bathroom stuff and the swimmer? college swimmer, you know, you just, you get so fired up about the violation of truth that you really forget that there, there are people in all these situations who are like struggling so deeply. And when we pick out like the most extreme news example of someone who's so radically X, Y, or Z that we forget that most people are probably sitting next to us in church wrestling with some of these same issues. And they just need, they need a place to talk about it. Um, they don't need to the truth to be compromised. They just need it to be spoken in humility, compassion, and love. So with all these topics, kind of what I tried to do, um, all of them come from messages that I preached at my church, is I tried to deeply understand like an issue from all the sides of it and understand you know, why people would think not what the Bible says, but some other option. And then I feel like that really just turned up my empathy, it never turned down my biblical passion, but it turned up my empathy to hopefully speak the truth and to speak it in love. That's cool. That's cool. I've looked at what is involved in taboo, and it's like there's there's so many seemingly different topics, right? But is there a common thread of that, like grace and truth, and like teaching people, showing that, the, like demonstrating how we can have those conversations? For sure. Yeah. Before I preached, um, a number of we had a, did a four week series called Gay and God, and before I did that, I reached out to like pastors in my community who believe that homosexuality is okay for Christians. And I reached out to LGBTQ organizations and like sat down, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee and just try to like, I would love to know just what you think about churches like mine and pastors like me. And out of those conversations just came so much clarity, um, so many beautiful things happened. I try to do that with abortion or couples that had gotten divorced. Like what, what do you wish your pastor would have done? What did he do well? What was super offensive, even though he had good intentions? And just out of those real life stories, I'm not a super empathetic guy by nature, but I, I couldn't forget those stories. And it just changed the tone of the messages. Good for you. No, that's cool. I think that a lot of times we do, like, you, like you're saying, like if we talk about it, there's like anger or disgust or like shock. Like, I can't believe the world's doing this. But when you mm -hmm. have those conversations, it's pretty cool. Also, like a lot of this stuff is rooted in compassion. I would say like it's a bit perverted, but like having compassion for uh for moms who are who are having abortions and like then tolerating the abortion out of compassion but when you actually understand where people are coming from there's a lot of, like a lot of times their heart is seemingly in a better place than we think mm -hmm. right so yeah. when when you had those conversations i'm wondering like you talk about you were impacted but i'm wondering on the other side were they like were they willing to hear you out when you sat down and and shared your views or just listen to them first for sure um I'm not going to say that everyone changed their mind yeah. and like confess the Bible is truth, but it definitely broke, broke the stereotype, you know, that Christians are going to keep their distance. They're not going to listen. They're just going to think they're better than everyone else. Um, so I just think that face-to-face -face interaction, uh, I mean, my fear for our culture today is that we have this 24 seven news cycle that's really driven by fear and anger. And so you find the most extreme examples that get people super afraid Like the world, this has to be the end times. Can you believe this is all happening? And like, we start to think that those are the normal positions when they're actually the extreme ones that spark the biggest emotional reaction and therefore get viewership up. Um, so when you actually sit down with another human being, it just takes, it takes all the air out of like the angry balloon. Mm. And it's like, okay, these, these are real people who make real decisions and came to real convictions for some reason. And if I can explore that, wow, we, we end up finding a lot more common ground than we might think. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Um, and I think having those conversations is, is so important because sometimes uh, you just feel like, I mean, I think people that maybe are looking at Christ followers or, you know, the church as whole, they feel like, well, you're on that team and I'm on this team. Mm -hmm. And um, really that's not the message of the gospel, right? It's uh it's so much better than that. And uh, just having the discussions with people to say, hey, no, we, I love you. I don't agree with you, but there's precedent for that. And let's talk about it. Let's, I want to hear your point of view, but I'm going to share, you know, scripturally why 
we believe what we believe. And really, this is about a human flourishing. I mean, that's the, the message of the gospel, too, is that this isn't to be down on you because you have a certain point of view, but there's a better way in mm. the sense that God wants you to flourish and have abundance. And mm. he is the creator. He has these boundaries that he's put in, uh, in, mm. in stone. Well, he set in stone for us, for our benefit. Mm. So, um, yeah. so true. And I'm just yeah, curious. My, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. My, my childhood pastor said, everyone believes something, but most people have never thought about why they believe what they believe. Mm. And so his way of getting in those conversations was say, Hey, tell me a bit, what, you know, what do you believe about God or marriage or whatever? And then people would just, you know, say whatever. And they say, wow, that's interesting. Well, you know, not everyone believes that. So why did you come to that conclusion? Yeah. And it's like, a, it's that the big old pebble in the shoe where most people think, huh? Yeah. Why do I believe that? I've never considered that. I've just kind of been indoctrinated by culture. Right. But I've never weighed the options, and I, I just love that approach. It's it's humble, it like it's quick to listen to quote James chapter one, and hopefully it opens some doors to like, oh yeah, and well, I have a reason why I came to this biblical conclusion, and here it is. And now suddenly I'm talking about Jesus, the resurrection, the scriptures, the things I really want to talk about that are going to change the human heart. Yeah, right. absolutely. <laughs> and I'm curious too, because uh, that list. Uh, that you have uh, touched on in this book is uh, pretty extensive um, and been a lot of hot button uh, issues there. Mm -hmm. Is there any one that you've gotten a little bit more pushback on, or maybe there's a few that you've had to kind of navigate through as you've written this book? For sure. <laughs> for, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Any like funny reactions? Yeah, yeah. that's right. I'm, I'm actually a former pastor looking for work. <laughs> <you guys>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, overall, I would say the response was really great. 98% um, of people like, wow, we I deal with that stuff every day. No one's ever talked about this. Thank you. Uh, I think where it got a little bit tense and messy, I would say the political chapters for sure. Um, and I would say the, the chapters we did, or the messages we did on abuse, for me, they were the most complicated because uh, I was trying to create a church culture that had a place both for abuse victims and repentant abusers. Mm. So if I was going to speak just to, Hey, if you're a victim of abuse, we love you. It's not your fault. God hates violence. Um, you know, I could preach that message, but the apostle Paul confessed in first Timothy one, that he was a violent man and a persecutor of innocent people. So if, if we're going to be the kind of church that actually has a place for all those who repent of their sin and look to Jesus, I mean, what does that look like to say? Yep. Yeah, I, I know you sexually abuse someone and I want you here next Sunday. Like that, that got messy really fast. Um, it took a ton of work. I, I don't know if we did it perfectly, but you know, having good boundaries to keep people safe. <laughs> but how do you feel safe when you know, like your brother in Christ next to you has like a history of controlling abusive behavior. So yeah. that, that one made me sweat and, and pray more than the others, I think. Yeah, uh, I can see that. Politically speaking, though, like in the book, did you endorse Trump or Biden? Which side are you on? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're, you're breaking up on me, man. Yeah, you don't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I can see why those two would get messy for yeah. sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But one of the one of the things that's been cool for me personally is seeing people who have abused people that then we help in the ministry, and it's like, man, you're you're just a broken person. You're just a hurting person mm -hmm. and you have your own abuse or your own neglect as, as a child or whatever and obviously it doesn't justify what's done but we can understand it has that been your experience like working with those people who have abused mm -hmm. others what's been your process with that how do you how have you viewed that personally over the years yeah uh matt i i think that category of people i'm not trying to rank sins or struggles is one of the toughest nuts to crack um, you know, because abuse is all about control. It's yes. like this insanely extreme selfishness that I'll I'll do anything, even hit you, threaten you, mock you, berate you at the end of the day to get what I want. So to turn around that kind of selfish heart is a man, it, it really does take a miracle of God. Um, I'm grateful. I, I think of one guy who he actually came, he saw us while he was in uh in a local jail. Uh, for a, a sexual crime, unfortunately, against an underage person, kind of digitally got caught with you know underage proposition. But he he knocked on the door of our church with such humility that as we tried to craft a plan, like what would it look like for him to be part of our church but not put other people in danger? 
And it strikes me that like he allowed us to tell his story like in front of the congregation, what he did um, to work with his parole officer. He said things like whatever rules you come up with, it's for my own benefit and yours. It, it would just show like, wow, that's humble. Like you're going to have a chaperone when you come on Sunday morning and you're okay with that. In fact, you're encouraging us to do it. Um, yeah, G God can do it. It's, it. In my experience, it's rare. But man, if someone humbles themselves, God can just exalt them to really beautiful places. Yeah, and that's the conversations that are arising because of what you're doing like this and with the story that's being shared. Um, sometimes that's part of the reason why these can be so taboo is because people never realize they can have um, kind of an outlet to be able to start discussing within people that that love Jesus. And they think that, oh, I, you know, I have this misconception or this misconstrued kind of idea of what it means to go to church and what it means to have the love and acceptance from God. So they just back away from that. So I'm glad that you've written this book and you're having the conversations, obviously not just for this book, but in the life of your ministry that has led you to this point. So that's so incredible. And to be able to share that story and those stories, even on a podcast like this, I hope anybody listening out there, um, whatever you've been through or whatever you have or haven't done, um, there's love, acceptance, and forgiveness for you. And um, and I think that's such a powerful message. Uh, and I'm, I'm so curious, Mike, uh, to, uh, you know, for someone that maybe one of these areas that you are, have touched on, maybe there's there's some sort of impact in someone's life in regards to this. Maybe it's pornography or one of the other many uh, here. Uh, could be sexuality, someone struggling, maybe suicidal thoughts. Um, whatever uh, they're going through in regards to how it connects to this book, what do you hope that someone who picks up this book and reads it, what, what do you hope that they do get out of this? Mm. Yeah, two things. Um, number one is a, a thousand kilometers. Uh, you guys use kilometers, right? I had to think oh, about that. Yes, You're right. I was yeah. thinking, wow. All, right. yeah. <laughs> All things. I don't know. I don't know how long that is, but I, I, I yeah. think it's a lot. <laughs> like yeah. he's a speaker. He knows how to speak to the crowd. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> All things to all people. Yeah. I mean, no, number one for me is I, I'm such a gospel guy. Um, there's a lot of good tips that we need maybe to change our behavior, whether it's like filtering software, an accountability partner. But to me, the thing that every soul craves most is the unconditional love of Jesus. Yeah. The it, It's finished. If we confess our sins, he's so faithful, he'll cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So every chapter, there's 29 chapters in this book, every chapter, I guarantee you're going to get a lot of gospel. So you might be at the bottom, you might be struggling, you might not be better yet. And I just wanted to bring as much gospel hope as I could. So you can you can bank on that in, in every page of the book. Um, second, I would say, kind of, um, you know, I have strengths and weaknesses as a person like you guys. Um, I would say my strength is researching things deeply. So for every one of these topics, I would just open up a Bible search engine. I type in something like anxious, anxiety, worry, fear, press enter, and I would read every every last thing the Bible has to say about this. Or here's the Greek word for to feel anxious. L let me see how that's used throughout the New Testament. And so I, I try to condense like all that biblical research about politics or depression or th there's 77 times that the Bible uses the word sex or sexual. What do they have in common? Fun fact, they're all warnings every single time in the whole Bible. I mean, the Bible exalts sex as good. You know, so I kind of do research like that. So that's kind of my hope that you're going to get a, a big picture of what the Bible says about all these topics. And no matter where you're at, whether you're doing great or falling on your face, that at the end of the day, there's going to be Jesus and a cross and an empty tomb and the forgiveness of your sins. I love it. I love it. That's cool. Yeah. And, and I mean, I read the book, like uh, I went through it and there's a lot of research and it's deep and I was, I loved it because it's, I can tell that that's a strength of yours and that you spend time doing that. And it kind of leads into my next question. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was, doing this i was preaching one day uh saturday night i kept waking up all throughout the night and the lord just kept putting things on my heart putting things on my mind and it was it was leading towards a sunday message so sunday morning i put together this message i was like man this is heavy it was a heavy warning message about sexual immorality and lots from revelation and just in the end times people be led astray through sexual immorality and and so it was cool because in that in that context with the heaviness and how somber kind of the room was, mm -hmm. um, we did an altar call for those wanting to repent of sexual sin. People came forward and it was beautiful in front of their church and family. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was really cool. Mm -hmm. But that 
has been on my heart so heavily. And so what I wanted to ask you is with sexuality being a warning, being referred to in that context in scripture, what do you see or what do you hope for just in that se- in the sexual area of the church? What do you what do you hope that people will move towards? We know Revelation talks about in the end days, in the end times there's going to be sexual sin. It's always going to be a reality. But what are you hoping for in the church regarding sexual sin? And I guess you could even go to the context of it being a warning in scripture. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I have oh, sorry, I can't can't locate it real quick. Um Many years ago, there's an artist at our church who created like this old looking scroll and actually kind of like burned parts of it with a lighter. So it looked like um, I said it was actually snatched from the fires of hell. This was my dramatic uh, (laughs) preaching moments. And I said it was the devil's favorite thing to say. And in church, I unrolled the scroll. It's like singed on the edges and it just has three words on it. And it says, God's not good. Hmm. And, and I think that's, maybe that's the warning I would want to give about this topic that please, please, please like do not believe that demonic lie that what God says in his word is not good because God's not good. It's hard. I I don't care if you're gay or straight, like to, (laughs) to do what the Bible says is not easy for anyone. If the, the strongest man in the Bible, Samson, the smartest man in the Bible, Solomon, and the most spiritual man in the Bible, David, all struggled with the exact same thing. It is not going to be easy for any of us. But just to believe at the end of the day, God's not putting this stuff about lust or honoring the marriage bed or a man and a woman. He's not doing that because he's bad. He's a good father. And everything that comes out of his lips and onto the page of scripture is for your good. So I think that's what I want just people to believe at the end of the day, that if God said it, even even if, if I'm struggling with it, it's got to be good because God in his essence is a good father. Mm. <clears throat> That's so good. I was so curious with this too, Mike, because I, I know this can be a tension that we feel in the church is um, the cultural understanding of tolerance and love is very different from the, the biblical standard of tolerance and love. Mm. Um, and sometimes a little bit of that creeps into our uh, understanding in the sense mm. that, well, if I'm going to love you, that means I celebrate what you know, maybe what you've identified at, as, or, um, or I, I tolerate it in the sense that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not either speaking towards it or I'm ignoring it, or again, the other end, you go the other end, which is kind of celebrate some of these things. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you, you navigated that tension. Cause I think sometimes in the church, because we've been so quiet and we're so, uh, in in some of these areas Mm -hmm. and we're, we're often, especially in the West, sometimes it seems there, there's a little bit of fear to be able to enter our, our hat into the ring with, so to speak with, with some of these topics, because mm. there is pushback. There is a lot of vitriol when it comes to some of these things. So mm. uh, I'm just curious how you navigated that tension. Cause it is something that I think we all feel in a certain sense, but it's so important that we stand true to, to what God's work calls us to, but yeah. to still be loving and kind. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. I don't know if it works, but it, It helps just to take that simple statement like, oh, you shouldn't judge or shouldn't we be taught? Shouldn't we just love and accept each other and just step back and say, okay, I I know you've heard that. Maybe you believe that. But do you really believe that? Like when when there's something happening in the Catholic Church, do you think we should just be tolerant? Um, when, When a husband is controlling, raising the back of his hand to his wife, do you just think none of us should judge because, hey, who's perfect? Like, no, come on, guys. Like all, all of us believe that there is some outside standard of good and bad that we should impose on other people. There's no way the world works without us all agreeing to that. So now the question isn't, should I judge you or you judge me? The question is, what standard are we going to judge each other by? Mm. So I think we just repeat this idea of we shouldn't judge. And we, we spend all day judging. The word judge simply means to make a distinction between right and wrong. Right. So yeah. if you think racism is bad, you're a judgmental person. Yeah. And that's good. That's right. very, yeah. very good. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> if you yeah. think it's good, it's good. That's your truth, <laughs> yes, right? That's right. your truth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, it's funny. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. What are the warnings? If it was sexuality, what are the warnings that you found in scripture? Why should this be taken super seriously? And why should it be not taken seriously just individually, 
but mm. in the church, why should it not be taboo? Why should pastors preach about it? What are the warnings? What, do, what does sexual immorality lead towards yeah. in people's lives? Yeah, I, so there's three chapters in the book. One is called Sex is Good, because that's where the Bible starts. Um, sex is work, meaning if you think it's as easy as you saw in porn, let me <laughs> let me introduce you to reality. But the third one kind of touches on your question. It's called Sex is Fiery. And that's the chapter that kind of explores those 77 passages. And I, I compare it. Um, so I live in Wisconsin where it's uh, decently cold for a lot of the year. Uh, my home has like a real fireplace in it. But um, I measured it the other day. The fireplace is about two cubic feet. And I think about like the square footage of my home and the eight foot ceilings or whatever it is. Like the actual percentage of the place where I make a fire in my home is minuscule. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Because I hate fire. No, actually, I love it. We make fires all the time. The smell of it, the ambiance of it. And obviously the answer is because if I tried to make a fire in the kitchen, very bad things would happen. No. <laughs> right. No. So the fires contain not because it's bad, but just because it's it's packed with the ability to do a lot of damage. Mm. And I, I think sex is exactly the same. Um, if you made fun of me when I was a kid. Okay, maybe it stung a little bit, but I, I moved past it. If I was sexually assaulted as a kid, mm. man, w one time can can burn you pretty bad. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't help my wife out with the dishes, or you know, I'm sitting there watching soccer while she's working hard, that's a sin. But that's very different than sleeping with another woman. That's also a sin, but that's going to cause way more damage. So God, who's a good father, once again, just knows. Um, sex is not the average thing. It, it it comes with incredible potential to bond, to give pleasure, to bring couples together. Or on the flip side, if you misuse it, if you take the fire out of the fireplace, to burn the people that God loves very deeply. So he's super protective about it. And that's where I think those 77 warnings come out of. I love it. That's a great, great picture for sure. And so true. So it is serious. I, I Again, we love that you wrote this book. I, I love just your ministry and what you do. Um, you went on a family holiday recently. You saw some cool spots in the States, right? Um, I saw on your Instagram, you were talking about how beautiful these places were, just the the great time that you had. And you come home and you're thinking, better is one day in your courts, Lord, than a thousand mm -hmm. elsewhere. Than, mm -hmm. or, and, and, and and like just like the beauty that you saw and like that was amazing, but better is even just one day in the presence of God. I've been so impacted by that. I think yeah. about that often. That was a few months ago, I think that you said that and um so cool so i would love for people to just follow you to find you get the book but also just follow what you do so where can people do that where can people get taboo where can people find you and just uh, get influenced by you yeah easiest place to find taboo is just on amazon um and then i work with a media ministry called time of grace so if you go to the website timeofgrace.org you can find all the books the tv program we do the devotions the video series the instagram stuff so timeofgrace.org Awesome. So go pick up that book, everybody. Uh, it's going to be a great resource for you. And I think, Mike, you were mentioning, it's a great gift to your kids if they're entering into that college age. Yeah. And um, um, so if you're a parent of, of kids at that age, that's a great gift. Um, but I think it's a great resource no matter stage of life we're in. Uh, it's so important to start having uh, the stigma removed from these conversations to talk about. It. And as a church, we can lead those conversations in a healthy way godly way so thank you mike for what you've done um your ministry the book uh, and coming on we've so appreciated having you on again we're gonna have to do it again honestly <laughs> for not sure. two years i think it was two years since last time we'll do it again quicker than that but <laughs> deal uh, i'd love to be back yeah appreciate you mike thank you so much and everybody out there listening thank you for journeying with us we hope you have a great week we're praying you on cheering you on and we'll check in with you next time